Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial, a museum and research center dedicated to preserving and presenting the history of General Douglas MacArthur, which includes the story of World War I and that of the millions of men and women who served in that war. In October 2016, the World War I Historical Association hosted a World War I Centennial Symposium at the MacArthur Memorial. The symposium focused on the year 1916. The following is a presentation by Carl Bobrow, a member of the Collections Department at the National Air and Space Museum, and an expert on the advent and development of Russian aviation. A hundred years ago, from just about now, the Brusilov Offensive had already ended by about a month. And uh, I'm not going to go into the specifics of the Brusilov Offensive other than to say that it was probably the one and only action by the Russians since the very beginning of the war that they succeeded at any offensive action other than their invasion of Germany in 1914, which was not a very good experience for them. But to understand uh, Russian aviation, we need to go back a little bit and we need to look at the development of Russian aviation. So I will do a quick overview of that to bring us up to speed where things are in 1916 when the Brusilov Offensive kicks off. In 1904, in their war with Japan, they were using uh, aerostats for aerial observation and for artillery uh, spotting. And um, there is quite a history in Russia of uh, the use of aerostats from that period on. In 1904, <clears throat> with Louis Blario crossing uh, the English Channel in July, it kicked off aviation in Europe, and the Grand Duke Alexander Mikhailovich was enthralled by this and realized that it was an opportunity for Russia for modernism and uh, the advent of flight to bring Russia into the 20th century. And there was a series of both military and civilian uh, air races and the development of aviation in Russia. And this is in 1910 at Komodansky Field at the uh, Kolomizinsky uh, race course uh, just outside of St. Petersburg. With the development of military aviation came the Gatchina uh, flying field and school for uh, Russian officers. It's interesting to note, to become a uh, Russian officer pilot, you needed to be of the faith. Uh, it took a uh, exception and a warrant by the Tsar to not be of Russian Orthodox. And so it was a very elite group. In this picture, we have General Kolbars, who was a good friend of Grand Duke Alexander Mikhailovich, who would go on to command the air assets for the northern group and during the First World War. And he was a cavalry officer, but he was also very much enthralled with aviation in general. And in 1911, 1912, he was already uh, participating, not as a pilot, but as a passenger. The Imperial Russian Air Fleet, their officers were involved in the production, not directly, but by observing and quality control of aircraft and this photograph is at the Dukes factory. Uh, and what we're looking at is French-designed Newport 4s, which were the mainstay of the early uh, Imperial Russian air fleet. This photograph is a composite. It was of the Russian uh, military maneuvers in 1912, and they put this photograph composited with an airplane to show that uh, aircraft were indeed participating, and they were. Uh, there were some very important developments in 
aviation and reconnaissance done by the Russians during this period because they realized that the aircraft provided a resource uh, that was not otherwise available for military uh, in the field. One of the proponents of this was a Russian pilot by uh, Pyotr Nesterov, who is shown here with his mechanic Nedelov in uh, May uh, 11, 1914, after they had completed a uh, one-day flight with three landings from Kiev to St. Petersburg in 18 hours. Uh, in the air for eight hours. Nesterov was a proponent of aviation and the development of aerial reconnaissance. He understood very well what it would mean in the uh, next war. And he is well known for doing the loop. And many people think that he was showing off, but he wasn't at all. What he had actually done was witness a number of his fellow pilots get involved in a maneuver that they couldn't get out of and die in a crash. And he determined to uh, take the role as a test pilot, if you will, and experiment with purposely doing maneuvers to learn how to get out of it and how to safely land. So he did the loop to determine this and uh, he had done quite a bit of investigation, including uh, checking with aerodynamicists on the role of the aircraft in doing such a maneuver. And he performed this maneuver and was court-martialed for it, but then he was subsequently released from his court-martial. Uh, in 1914, he died in an action against an Austro-Hungarian uh, uh, aircraft and that was uh, as a result of his understanding that the aerial reconnaissance that was being performed was detrimental to the, uh, the troops on the ground. And his first attempts were to intercept by having a large blade attached to the landing gear because he was such an excellent pilot. He believed he could slice the upper wing of an aircraft with it. It didn't work. And then he believed that he could uh, perform what would be known as a Tehran, a ram, not to kill himself, but to wreck the Austrian aircraft by putting his landing gear into the wing. Uh, the one thing that he didn't take into consideration is what happened, and that it was his landing gear would g become entangled, and the two aircraft um, descended, and he died as a result. Igor Ivanovich Sikorsky, uh, we have him here placed in the BIS-1, the first aircraft that he built along with two others, individuals. It had a 15 horsepower on Zani. This aircraft was not intended to fly. He wanted to learn about ground control and hops and it was specifically designed so that it would not fly but gave him practical knowledge. This was the course of how this great man developed in aviation as a whole. He was very precise and exact in his developments. He was observant. He brought around him wonderful engineers and individuals who understood what was required. And he would go on, as we well know, uh, after his term in Russia to come to the United States uh, during the time of the revolution and build a career here as well. In 1913, between 1910 and 1913, he began developing his own aircraft and in 1912 began working for the RBVZ, the Russo-Baltic Wagon Works, and in 1913 convinced the chairman of the company Mikhail Shudlovsky, whose name will come in later, to allow him to build a multi-engine aircraft for transport. And this is the first time this is being done. We have him here placed in 1913 at the uh, front of the uh, Grand or Bolshoi Baltiski, Great Baltic, 
or Ruski Vietiz, Russian Knight. It had many names depending on the time of development because first it went from uh, twin tractor to four engine tractor pusher to finally to a four tractor version, which we see here. And the tall figure on the left is Grand Duke Alexander Mihailovich, who is the, uh, as I have stated, the uh, originator for aviation in Russia by uh, getting the imperial decree for aviation to commence. This aircraft was a proof of concept for this, which was in February 1914, the first time it flew. This is the Ilyu Muromets. This is number 107 with Argus 100 horsepower engines. Now, those are German engines, and this is a very interesting point because in Russia, the development of quality engines did not begin until late 1915, and that was a limited group of RBVZ-6 engines, which were copies of Mercedes engines. This is a well-known photograph of Igor uh, on the top of the Ilya Muromets. The uh, caban that you see on the top was originally intended to support a middle third wing, which was removed after the first test flight when it was realized that it wasn't needed. But the structure, which was integral to the fuselage, remained and provided this wonderful opportunity to stand up there. And there's that wonderful photograph of the Ilya Muromets coming in at Komodansky Field with two men on the top of the fuselage. I'm just wondering how he got this photograph taken. <laughs> it was probably his mechanic and good friend Panasiewicz who climbed out onto the fuselage with nothing there. Well, 1914 comes very quickly, and after his epic flight, which was on June 22nd, to, from St. Petersburg to Kiev nonstop on the heels of the flight earlier. He makes this flight, and then while all this celebration is going on, tragedy occurs in Sarajevo with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Russia invades Germany as part of the agreement with France, and at initially, what seems to be going really well uh, turns out to be uh, a devastating failure. Now, I've heard over the intervening years that the Russians did not have air assets at the beginning of the war or that all the aircraft that they were using were worn out. Well, none of that's true. Let me explain something. The Russians had a large air fleet. The issue at hand was that the air assets that were sent to Tannenberg by the Russians were from the 15th KAO, which is an air group that is stationed outside of Warsaw, Warsaw uh, Fortress. So there were two types of aviation units in the beginning of the war. Those were those units that were of the Russians that were assigned to a fortress and then those which were assigned to a core group. The core groups would be mobile with the military corps. The fortress were stationed at the various fortresses throughout the Russian Empire. The 15th was a fortress group that was sent to the north to participate in Tannenberg, and it was very improvisational, and the Russians did not do very well with improvisation, and there was that problem that they had. The other aspect was the question of aircraft being worn out. The requirements at that time for an airframe and for an overhaul of the engine, which would come later on in the war as being a, a longer period of time between how many hours of flight you could use an engine before it needed an overhaul, and at the time of 1914 were uh, a two to one ratio. The problem was is you needed spare parts, you needed spare linen, you needed cabling, you needed everything that you needed to rebuild an aircraft, and that meant you had to have a large workshop and maintenance 
And the issue at hand was that the Russians did not have a lot of material, and they had to rely upon foreign. They had the parts, but the issue was supply and distribution. So the aircraft were not worn out. It's just that you couldn't resupply and get them uh, operational in the field if the material was 100 miles away. Well, the commanders at the time were hesitant to use the aircraft, and so there was an order not to fly the aircraft until it was necessary. Well, as a commander, how do you know when to send an aircraft out into the field to do reconnaissance? You just need it up there just all the time, but at that period of time, they were reticent to send it out because they didn't have the spares, so they were holding off on doing the operation. Well, the 15th KAO did participate in air operations. They did locate the Germans uh, where they were and what was going on. They gave the reports, but those reports were not taken into consideration as part of the planning, unfortunately. For the Germans on the other side, uh, Lieutenant Hess and Conner, as well as Cantor and Mertens, uh, flying uh, 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 Taube, uh, they were very successful. They participated. In my studies, along with my two co-authors, we have determined from the 8th Army diary, the German 8th Army, that there was an increase in requests for aerial reconnaissance that began with one or two sorties to an exponential level by the time of the end of uh, Missourian Lakes that indicates to us that the Germans were well prepared for air operations in the field and possibly because they had home advantage. The um, translation roughly says, uh, uh, Neidenberg, after destruction by the Russians on the 22nd of August, uh, this Russian Russ airship, which is in the market, was shot down. It wasn't shot down. It was captured. It was left behind by the Russians. They burnt the frame as best they could. They made it unusable, removed the engine, and took it with them. Uh, Meanwhile, in Galatia, things went a little bit better, possibly because the only force on the ground that was tactically and strategically and operationally worse put together than the Russians were the Austro-Hungarians. Put that in a nutshell. In the case of Galatia, your air, Russian air assets are with core. So they are already part of a, uh, a mobile group. They are uh, integrated. Uh, maybe they're not understood as well uh, for what their purposes are in 1914, but certainly their participation is, more, is, is better connected. And so you have, uh, at this time, uh, again, 1914, uh, a new port four uh, being used in Galatia, or in this case, a Moron Saulnier G uh, with the observer uh, using a camera. Yes, there was photography. Uh, the Austro Hungarians were also fielding aircraft at that time. Uh, this is from a photo diary uh, that uh, we have access to uh, the Austro Hungarian. This is from 1914 in Galatia. And they did photography. So this photograph is by Austro-Hungarian uh, aircraft of uh, a Russian battery and infantry in Galicia. It's, uh, I'm not going to try and murder the name. Um, I had it in my mouth um, when I pronounced it yesterday, but I'm not going to try uh, today. But it's between Lviv and Krakow. To give a an overview of the size of the Russian front. This puts it in comparison. Uh, if we took California and put it in that area, and if any of you have ever uh, driven from one part of California to the other, you realize that this is an extensive uh, front. So with this, you have a different uh, type of operation. You have a lot more space to fly, 
without encountering another aircraft. In 1915, things do not go well for the Russians. Um, part of that is, is the Germans are well involved in the Austrian operations after the debacle of Galatia. And this says much. Now we are again right into completely mobile warfare. I fly over the enemy almost daily and bring back reports. I reported the retreat of the Russians three days ago. It is so much more fun for me. I am especially happy to be right here in the most important theater of operations and to be able to participate it. As you can see, the front line shifted from here to here, and that is everything that they had, and then they were pushed back further beyond the border. So things have not gone well for the Russians in 19. The Russians are flying uh, Walsan uh, 3. These are uh, both uh, imported from France and uh, domestic built. Uh, I believe by war's end, they had imported 800 from France and had built 400 of their own. That's quite a number of aircraft. Uh, they're relying upon foreign designs for the most part. Uh, again, this is 1915. They're still using Newport 4s and uh, for reconnaissance. In this case, I'm not going to go into details, but I want to point this camera out to you. You'll notice there's a lens here, and then there's what looks like two optic dials there, or gauges. We'll talk about that a little later. And air observation was the key essence of aerial warfare on the Eastern Front. Uh, aerial observation, because you had such large movement of troops and ground area to cover Aerial observation was the only thing that would enable that to, uh, to be available to give reports, that and photography. In this photograph, we have a Newport 4 captured by the Austro-Hungarians. And but the Russians had one thing that no one else had by this time. They had a military version of the Ilya Munermets. In this case, this is the type V. They had, by 1915, uh, deployed the Ilya Monomets through a, a squadron of flying ships, a Skadar of Vodizhny which began in late 14, but operational in March 1915. Uh, and here um, is very happy members of the various airships, because there's a large squadron of uh, uh, six ships. Uh, and this is Yelbolna near Warsaw. And from the air, and you can see these large tents. And an interesting fact is the person who designed these tents, these mobile tents, is the same individual who designed the camera. And I will go into that more in detail. But it's, it, he, he was actually uh, a brilliant in, inventor and, uh, and involved in uh, early Russian aviation. As a matter of fact, he was one of the commandants at the Ganshina uh, Flying School. I love this. This is typical uh, reconnaissance group. This is from Feldflieger Abteilung 4. This is uh, Lieutenant of Reserves Koister and Hauptmann Nuber. Uh, Koister is later the ambassador to France. And uh, the <laughs> it's a very informal picture because if you take a look at the ground crew, uh, they're almost uh, hamming it up there. Um, but uh, the, uh, the Germans and the Austrians had quite a number of air assets. By this time, it's developing to a two to one ratio. And they were well armed. So the two seaters were acting both as observation aircraft and if they came across the Russians, then as fighters. And this is an important aspect to remember. The plan for 1916 for the Brusilov offensive is a very large front. And I'm not gonna go into details 
and because we're going to get uh, a really good outline from uh, Jack Tung still tomorrow on the Brussels Offensive. But uh, let me say this. The requirements for the Brussels Offensive come about because the French are under great pressure on the Western Front at Verdun. They need help. They need Germans drawn off. The British need help because if the French collapse, they can't hold the line. The Italians are prostrating themselves to the Tsar asking for help because things are not going well with the Austrians in the south against Italy. Italians are losing. And so the Russian command is trying to figure out, well, in March they have an offensive and it stalls and it goes nowhere. It comes to, to the topic of how we're going to do this. And Brusilov has a plan. How much of a plan? He's got a very good plan. He's ready to implement it. He's been working this out, not by himself, but with uh, a team uh, that works closely with him in determining what is going to work. He's brought a core of individuals around him that believe that they can make a difference and make uh, a, a, an innovative attack against the Austrians and the Germans on the front and break through and change the course of the war, not only for Russia but for the Allies as well. He proposes it, it gets accepted. In between, he has been having air reconnaissance fly, make flights uh, over the enemy lines, doing a great amount of reconnaissance, uh, photographing uh, the terrain, uh, taking that, doing photo interpretations, building detailed replicas of the uh, the front, uh, doing 3D modeling, actual terrain maps. Uh, he is <clears throat> requiring uh, a massive amount of information to come. And this is the type of photography that this Ulyanin camera uh, produces. And you can clearly see um, the uh, trench line, uh, the two dials that I pointed out on that camera. One is an altimeter and the other is a clock. And with that, you, if you know your course and you have that plotted out, you know exactly where this is that you have flown. And so they can you then use that. That camera is developed in 1912 by Colonel Yannin. Uh, it is uh, gone through a couple of various forms and iterations, and by 1916, it is widely used throughout the Imperial Russian Air Fleet. There are various Russian designs that are beginning to make their way into uh, the frontline use, and they are well armed. And as I said, <clears throat> they are at a two-to-one disadvantage, and remember, they're flying over the line, so they're flying into the enemy territory. So here we have a photograph that was taken with a POT camera, P-O-T-T-E, which is a little bit different than the Oyanin, but a very innovative camera, which I will discuss later, and photo interpretation of where the batteries are. Uh, the photograph we're looking at here is of Esel uh, Chakev, who is a Cossack captain, and by this time there is the push to create Russian fighter squadron. And the reason for that is because they are being uh, attacked, the reconnaissance aircraft are being attacked, they can't get the photographs that they need, and so it is determined to create fighter groups to protect the reconnaissance aircraft on their flights. Uh, they were not aware when they were uh, f flying against the Austro-Hungarians and Germans what exactly they were f against because they couldn't uh, identify all the uh, German airfields and there were about 34 of them. 
By this time, they're also receiving from the French Newport 11s uh, with a machine gun uh, mounted on the uh, upper wing, so they have um, fighter escorts of a better quality than uh, some of their uh, earlier aircraft. And transport for the uh, aircraft are done on the Russian rail lines to um, move squadrons from uh, location to location as necessary. We come back to the Ilya Monomets. The Ilya Monomets is a long-range reconnaissance and bomber. It is your precursor to the Predator. It can remain in the air as long as six hours, depending on its fuel load and how many individuals are on board and how much armament it's carrying. That's a long time. Uh, it carries armament, and if, if you take a look here, there's a tail gun, and there's a gun in the window, and then there's a gun up on top. So it is well defended. The Germans call them hedgehogging. Uh, that's because they're bristling, and so they're avoided. Um, but as the Brusilov offensive goes on and there's a greater degree of enemy um, fighter to Russian aircraft, the encounters with uh, the Austro-Hungarians as well as the Germans uh, begin taking uh, serious um, uh, account for uh, Ilya Muromet's attacks uh, where you'll have two to three aircraft attacking in Ilya Muromet's at the same time. And, uh, there's a number of them that get shot up and a number of them that have wounded and dead in the crew but they manage to get another uh, high quality uh, photograph that was supplied to General Brusilov and transport, again, is by rail. Uh, the Russians made use of their rail lines. And it's, a, it's an interesting study. Uh, it's part of the uh, larger uh, copious of uh, the work that we're working on of uh, the uh, distribution of supplies, as I indicated. When you're dealing with aircraft that are using four engines, and they were using uh, the engines of eight different manufacturers, uh, Samson, uh, uh, Beardmore, Sunbeam, Argus. Yes, they were still using Argus engines and uh, the RBVZ engines. So you can see that they had quite a number. Um, and there was also uh, talk of them using Hall Scott from America and uh, Italian engines. And they were massive. As Steve pointed out with the German aircraft earlier, these are large aircraft and it took a lot of uh, manpower to move them on the field. In this case, this Ilya Munomets has, uh, and it's quite evident by the engine shapes, uh, these are uh, Sompsons. Uh, a lot of frontal drag, not very efficient, but uh, nonetheless they used what they had and they could. This is a great photograph of um, uh, Igor Sikorsky and Captain uh, Nizhevsky in July 1916. And as I pointed out, uh, they're well armed. It's a Lewis and Madsen uh, gun. And this is a contemporary drawing. This was done by one of the crew of an aerial encounter between it, Ilya Monomets and presumably Austrian uh, from the, um, the documentation that goes with it. Now let me say something about the importance of aero reconnaissance. Uh, Brusilov required and, well, really needed it. I mean, without that, I don't believe that he would have been able to put forth and succeed at the level that he did because he really needed to know where the Austrians were and what he was coming up against and he made very good use of the aerial assets. It was at great cost to the Russians, though, because they did, uh, as I pointed out, and you'll see later, uh, were up against uh, something that they didn't realize. Unfortunately, uh, all good things come to an end. Uh, the Ilya Munomets, which had survived multiple attacks uh, in September 26, 1916, by the end of the 
Bruce Love um, offensive had uh, lost one of their ships to an attack. Um, there were three uh, German uh, two-seaters attacking it, and uh, uh, Lieutenant Wolf of uh, Feldflieger 45 um, you know, was managed to shoot uh, Ilya Munomet 16 of Lieutenant uh, Makshiev's uh, and his crew of three down. Uh, this is a, an example of a Ilya Munomets type ga. There were um, the, and this creates a lot of confusions of the models and when people are looking at Ilya Munomets, uh, they don't understand. Uh, Sikorsky kept on building different forms of the Ilya Munomets. As you saw, there was a picture of him at the front uh, with, with uh, Captain Nizhevsky. He was constantly going to the front, learning what the requirements were, determining what the uh, problems were, and improving, constantly improving. So one of the things that he did by uh, 19, late 1916, early 1917, were already in closing the gas tanks uh, and making them uh, with uh, rubber and felt impregnated with chemicals to prevent them from catching fire. Uh, the um, engines were being shielded as best as possible to prevent uh, attack from uh, uh, enemy uh, anti-aircraft as well as um, machine gun bullets uh, to prevent lines and possible uh, destruction of the engine, even though they could fly on two engines. And uh, another example of aero reconnaissance from the time, um, Austrian front line and another uh, showing uh, in good detail uh, the uh, trenches. In this brief overview, I'm trying to uh, bring out the point that the Russians contributed significantly to Brusilov's efforts. Uh, and I think one of the uh, best uh, examples of that is this group of photographs. Now, this is taken by Ilya Monomets of the Austrian front um, just before the attack in June of the Brusilov launch of the offensive, this after the bombardment. So by having this information delivered to them very quickly, they had a good idea of how effective their bombardment was against the Austrian uh, trench system. So much so that General Brusilov went to the EVK uh, to personally inspect and congratulate them for their efforts on the uh, offensive. And we see here uh, the type, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Ilya Muromets, which has a lot more glass. It's uh, not bulletproof, but it's shatter-resistant glass. There's much more glazing. And although this panoramic photo cannot be uh, enhanced in this situation for you to see, this is the German base at Cavell. And there are nearly 100 German aircraft at this base. They are fighters, uh, they are single-seat fighters, they are two-seaters, uh, they are well-prepared. The Russians couldn't get to this base. Every time they came near the space to do a photo recon of it, they were attacked. They were never able to get uh, aerial photographs uh, of the base. They knew about it, they knew that there was a concentration, but they couldn't tell. There were uh, a large supply of material uh, to the Germans at this base. When the uh, Brusov offensive was well underway, the Germans moved a large number of um, material in both uh, troops and air resources from the Western Front and brought them to uh, Covell and the Eastern Front to counter the Russians. In that, they brought pilots who were well-trained fighter pilots at this point, uh, had practice on the Western Front, and were able to introduce and teach uh, their um, 
comrades in arms on the Eastern Front the tactics that they had picked up and it became very effective. They also brought with them um, more uh, AGO bombers from the, um, uh, with them and made good use of attacking Russian uh, unopposed Russian uh, concentrations of troops and supplies uh, behind the Russian lines uh, in the uh, later stages of the uh, Brusilov Offensive, uh, which helped blunt the effectiveness of the uh, offensive. It's not well understood. As I pointed out, uh, this is uh, a well-armed and seasoned crew and the Germans had the advantage of aerial reconnaissance and they knew where the Russians were. Uh, this is a uh, German uh, photograph from a Bavarian group of uh, Russian uh, uh, base and uh, they would harass them, uh, attacking them uh, on the grounds as well as by strafing as well as bombing once they identify them. This wonderful photograph, which is well known now, is a uh, German Fokker uh, Eindecker E235 from Feldflieger Uplung uh, 14, and it's using a synchronization um, machine gun on there. And this is uh, uh, early spring of 1916, so the Germans are already supplying the Eastern Front with uh, uh, well-armed. Uh, the Austrians are using uh, the same aircraft uh, built for them and they're using Schwarzlose uh, machine guns in their synchronization. Uh, this is uh, Hauptmann uh, uh, Balke and uh, this is uh, uh, August uh, 11th uh, in 1916. Uh, the Second uh, Seventh Army uh, Aviation Detachment. Uh, the pilot was a senior co uh, commissioned officer, non-commissioned officer, uh, Kolotnikov and Lieutenant uh, Temenkov, uh, flew from an air, uh, airfield on a reconnaissance mission and following an air combat, uh, the pilot Kolotnikov being wounded landed on the German side of the line and the aircraft was of Wasson uh, 637. And uh, here he is. And at first, when I looked at this photograph and I saw the, he was wearing his cap, I figured, oh, no, he's just a Russian officer who was uh, captured. Uh, and this is a propaganda picture uh, because uh, Bokeh is well known in Germany. And so it says here that he you know, basically shot him down, but that's not what happened. Basically, what happened is he was brought down by others and the reason why I doubted it was because of the cap and then I found out that Russian officers often flew with their caps and so did the Germans uh, in their, uh, in their uh, cockpit. Uh, any of you ever ride a motorcycle? Have you, after you've done a two or three hour ride you take your helmet off and you have a helmet head, your hair is plastered. Well, I figured that's why they carry their caps because they came out of the aircraft and, and they had a helmet head and they just said, oh, and they put their cap on because I couldn't imagine why else would he want to wear the cap other than to pose for a photograph with the Germans who just captured you. So maybe he knew that this, in the morning, I don't know. Well, let me talk a little bit about photographic equipment. The Russians very early on uh, were using um, uh, a quality photographic equipment that were designed in Russia. Uh, the lenses were German lenses, but the camera design were uh, Russian. Uh, you have here a Newport 4, uh, and you can see the cutout for the camera and the viewport for the pilot to look down and see what they're photographing. In this case, you have uh, Marine Saulnier parasol, and you have a picture. I can't see it from where I'm standing. By the end of this, any one of you will look at one of these photographs and go, look, I know Jan and camera. I recognize it. 
And this is a clearer picture. And so now you can see the lens, you can see the altimeter and the clock. And when you look at this uh, photograph close up, as I have, you can read the dials. And it's a great, great photograph to uh, understand. I have the manual, uh, the Russian manual on the operation and use of the Russian cameras, the two cameras, to better understand what we're dealing with. And as you can see here, clearly the two dials in the photograph to remind you. And photo interpretation, and this is a Olyanin camera, and it shows the, uh, the effects of an Ilya Muromets bombing on a rail yard. This is the Pot camera, and it is film. It is strip film. It is uh, uh, continuous. So as they fly over the fields, uh, they, it's one long strip. So it's a, it's a, and there we have a, a photograph of a uh, Marin Saulnier uh, with a Pot camera. And this is a Pot image and a photo lab and developing in the field. And this is a Russian photo lab, portable. Now the Germans have a large range of cameras and they're, uh, the most important are initially the hand camera, these, uh, which are developed. Uh, and then, of course, your, um, probably least known but most important camera is the Rheinbilder camera, which is a strip camera that does uh, overlays and provides uh, very accurate information. And the Austro-Hungarians also built their own portable labs. Now just quickly, uh, through this, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, the wireless radio equipment because it was used uh, very early on, and in 1916 the Russians were deploying it. Uh, this is a mobile base for uh, radio. That's a helical coil, and that is uh, French design, and the Russians are using spark radio transmission. And you can see the antenna uh, down underneath. This is a Russian design uh, wireless system. And they're using uh, the uh, wireless for uh, artillery spotting. Uh, what we're looking at here is Austro-Hungarian uh, slash German uh, wireless, and you can see it's very sophisticated, as I was telling you. Uh, and this is a Austro-Hungarian mobile station. These are my two co-authors. Uh, we're working on a four-volume set on aerial reconnaissance on the Eastern Front. We are using 1914, 15, 16, and 17 with specific battles as the, uh, the focus. Uh, 1914, Tannenberg and Galatia. 1915, the retreat. 1916, uh, the um, Brusilov. And 1917, uh, the uh, wrap-up. Uh, here we are in Munich. Uh, that's Helmut Jaeger, colonel, former colonel of the uh, German um, Air Force, and Terry Finnegan, uh, former colonel of the U.S. Air Force, and me, uh, honorary member of the Imperial Russian Air Fleet. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.